From the age of 16, I was absolutely determined to join the army. So I went straight from school to Sandhurst, two-year uh, course in those days. Um, I then, until Christmas of that year, um, did various School of Infantry courses in Hythe, uh, weapons and signals, and then Warminster for tactics. And then in very early January 1966, I flew out to join the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Anglian Regiment in uh, Cyprus. And I shan't forget the first day, uh, very, very, feeling like a very strange schoolboy. Nobody had warned me that the battalion wore side hats, or the officers wore side hats. So, you know, you, you're determined to um, be, show you the best side. And that wasn't the way to do it, being incorrectly dressed, but there we go. And uh, it, in the mess uh, before lunch, having drinks, um, a field officer said to me, do you play rugby? I said, well, I did play scrum half at prep school eight years ago. He said, right, you're playing for the battalion this afternoon. So that was my introduction to a very unsuccessful um, sporting career with the battalion. So I then had a year and a half in Cyprus, which was very exciting in many ways. We used to go over to Libya on exercise. Uh, the only boring bit was I arrived in time for the annual inspection. So, of course, uh, uh, as a young officer, I had to keep out of the way, really, and leave it all to the senior NCOs. But it was uh, a tremendous place to be out in the Middle East. Uh, lovely weather, um, enjoyable soldiering. And uh, that kept me quiet until August uh, 1967. Uh, I then came back to the UK and for 18 months took over the 16th Army Youth Team in Northamptonshire, which consisted of going around youth clubs, not direct recruiting, but certainly encouraging youngsters to think about uh, joining the army. Um, and that was my first real sort of stay in, in, in England, joining the life of the town, uh, becoming known um, by certainly the leaders of youth clubs. Uh, after the youth team, I then uh, had a slightly unhappy uh, 18 months with the battalion. I was made intelligence officer, which was not really my scene and I didn't get a very good confidential report from uh, Colonel John Akehurst. Um, but uh, again, it was challenging. We had trips to uh, Kenya and a uh, big exercise in uh, Malaysia uh, in um, about August 1970, 1970 I think, yes. Um, I actually got married uh, the first time round in September uh, 1970. And six weeks after that, we did our first tour in Northern Ireland, Bally Murphy, where I was appointed a, com a second in command uh, of um, C Company, I think it was. Uh, we had a, reg un a regrettable start to the tour in that uh, my current commander uh, took his own life, which was a very sad uh, situation. And the company was taken over by Captain uh, John Hart, who um, was a senior captain in the battalion at the time. We had four very, again, challenging months in Bally Murphy. It was, uh, in a way, the start of the troubles. Uh, it was a situation which one felt absolutely piggy in the middle. Uh, there was a, an estate we had to look after with 650 houses, uh, ordinary two, three bedroom detached or semi-detached, uh, with an average of 12 people per household no playgrounds for the kids, no community centres for the uh, mothers and wives. So what do you expect people but to cause trouble? Uh, and as we left, the situation was beginning to get fairly serious with shootings rather than just, I say just rioting. Um, but uh, that was our first tour in, in Bally Murphy and my first Christmas away from home uh, and away from um, my then wife. Um, I was then posted to the Junior Infantryman's Battalion, Shorncliffe, again as a company 2IC. Um, interesting there in that every single infantry regiment was represented and uh, I had various tasks. My job was actually civilianised before I arrived, but the Colonel said you may as well come anyway. So I was in charge of driver training, uh, a sports officer. Um, I think those are about the two main uh, positions, but the beauty of that was it was two years um, 
based on a sort of school program, so you had guaranteed uh, leave every so often, which uh, as early marriage life, it uh, certainly made life easier and more pleasant. Uh, and from there, I went on my second tour to Londonderry. Uh, this would have been in um, late 1973. And uh, in October of that year, uh, I was injured uh, when a parcel I was holding uh, exploded. Uh, killed, regrettably, 2nd Lieutenant Lynn Dobby, uh, RAOC, who was doing a six-month detachment with the infantry, uh, who was uh, sitting next to me. And, uh, well, the rest is history. Uh, the 3rd of October is a day I shan't forget, that's when my life changed. Um, the parcel I was actually holding in my left hand, which I've still got, uh, Lynn Dobby was sitting on my left, and uh, I saw, I felt, I heard nothing. It just suddenly went very quiet, uh, very silent, and, and that was it. The parcel, uh, which had been booby-trapped, had, had gone off. Um, I remember coming in and out of consciousness on that time. We could hear the uh, ambulance bell, uh, siren ringing, it was a Saracen armored car, etc, etc. Um, but uh, waking up, obviously, I thought, well, surely that's the end of life, having been told that I probably would never see again. Um, and, uh, uh, well, it, it's proved quite opposite to that, so I can assure you. But I, I spent a week in intensive care in the Alton McGelvin Hospital. I was then casivacked uh, back to the military hospital at Millbank, as it was in those days. And whilst I was there, about three weeks later, somebody came to see me and said, I'm from St Dunstan's, and told me all about the charity which had been looking after uh, men and women blinded in the service of their country uh, since um, 1915. And it sounded that, you know, they could put me back on my feet and, you know, make, give me employment, etc., etc. So it obviously seemed the, the answer. Well, um, after just under six weeks in hospital, they said, well, go home and convalesce. I said, no, I, I don't want to spend another two weeks lying around doing nothing. The sooner I get started, the sooner I get back to a, quotes normal way of life. And so um, six weeks later... As I said, uh, I was taken down to St Dunstan's in Brighton uh, and uh, slowly, just with uh, three half-hour training periods a day, I started my rehabilitation, uh, which went on for about six months. Again, the army were absolutely fantastic. Um, they asked me where I wanted a, an army quarter because I'd given up. Uh, we were going to go to Germany when I got back from Londonderry. Um, and uh, so we chose uh, Aldershot because of the Queen Margaret Maternity Hospital. My, I, my ex was about four months pregnant at the time. So we wanted the best uh, uh, hospitalisation for, for that event. Um, and that happened in February, about uh, what, four, uh, five months after I was injured, uh, that uh, my son Jonathan was born. Um, so the six months I had at St Dunstan's in those days, um, I should say the charity has now changed its name to Blind Veterans UK to be a bit more overt about what, who we are and what we do. Uh, we changed our name in um, to 2012. Um, but learning the skills I had to learn Braille, um, typing, because that's how we uh, could obviously write and, and to people. Uh, what we call daily living skills, uh, learning to cope in the kitchen, dial numbers, sign your name, all sorts of extraneous uh, 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 affairs. And uh, what was the other one? Um, mobility, which is the art of getting around with a long cane, both indoors and outdoors. So that was a fairly intense uh, uh, six months. I also, in, in addition, did a French correspondence course, because I thought at that time... Uh, I would follow my father's footsteps as a conference interpreter. Uh, he was a civilian at Shape in uh, Mons in Belgium. And I thought for a blind person sitting in a booth, listening to someone spouting uh, or making a speech in English and regurgitating it in French uh, would be quite a, a good job for a, a visually handicapped person. So I, um, after I'd finished my training at St Dunstan's, uh, the, the, the six months, I did go over to Belgium and um, to Mons, 
because uh, obviously my parents lived up the road, so it's good to have a bit of family backup. And I knew Mons by sight, uh, having visited my parents obviously on holiday before. And uh, embarked on a two year uh, course as a quote free student, meaning that I was free to sit in on the um, lectures, but I wouldn't get a qualification at the end of it. Um, but uh, trying to immerse myself in, in French. Um, I, I was pretty fluent to start off with uh, because the family had moved over to France when I was seven. But, uh, you know, I still wasn't totally bilingual like my father, so I had to work quite hard at that. Um, but after two years, uh, for all sorts of reasons, I came back to London. I wanted to get, in to get a job and get going, you know, not just uh, being a perpetual student. Um, and. Uh, uh, so I went for an interview. There was only one permanent vacancy going. Uh, the rest would, be, would have been freelance, which would mean I needed somebody to help me with travel, reading documents to me beforehand and so on. Anyway, I went for this permanent job and absolutely failed miserably at the uh, interview and the test. So uh, that, that wasn't uh, to be. Uh, I did have two um, freelance jobs. I was in the dock in uh, Bow Street Magistrates Court uh, doing a bit of court interpreting and um, there was a press conference given by a diplomat from the Belgian Congo, I think it was, uh, who I actually was interviewed by one reporter, that was the press conference, and they each understood each other's language anyway, but so I wasn't really totally needed, but uh, I still got paid for it. Anyway, it looked like um, interpreting wasn't going to work out. <clears throat> Um, by then, I had actually in, been interviewed by St Dunstan's and offered a job. I said, well, please, you know, let me try and this interpreting since I've been training for it. I don't want to waste it. Uh, but as I said, it, it didn't look very hopeful. So I went back to St Dunstan's and said with alacrity, yes, please. And it was as Assistant Public Relations Officer. Uh, I then spent the subsequent 34 years working for the, the, the charity. Uh, and having a fantastic uh, time. The challenges uh, and the experiences which I never would have had uh, if I'd not been injured. Uh, I think it'd be better to have had the experience without going through the business of being injured, but that uh, was not to be. But I had to say 34 very um, fruitful and enjoyable years uh, because all our members are ex-service, that's the criteria for being looked after by the charity. And uh, they're even the first warm people I met um, when I first arrived at St Dunstan's in training. They were residents there. But speaking to them, uh, hearing their experiences and so on, absolutely fascinating. And of course, you've got the challenge of joining people on the ski slope. Um, I organised a walking club. Um, I organised a computer club. Uh, it was, I say, a fascinating time, and still is. And we now have youngsters from uh, uh, blinded in Afghanistan, and so on. So that, unfortunately, there will always be a need for our charity. Now called it, as I've already said, Blind Veterans UK. When I left Belgium and got back to the United Kingdom, it was then I discovered that the regimental association had actually contacted the British element at uh, SHAPE and asked them to look after me. And I can't tell you what a wonderful, warm feeling that gave me, knowing that, you know, brother officers standing together, uh, supporting each other, uh, that went on, even though by then I was out of the army. So that was a, a, a very high point in, in the story. I do have to say that uh, I had the great honour of being made an OBE uh, in the 2012 uh, honours list uh, for services to uh, fellow war blind veterans. Uh, again, an experience I wouldn't have enjoyed had I not been injured. So that was quite good. And uh, I was elected president of um, Blind Veterans UK in 2004. Again, another, uh, I won't say ambition, but uh, I, I dreamt one day, wouldn't it be wonderful if I made that? because I owe so much to the charity. It really has given me my life back again, literally, uh, and uh, wanted to give something back to the charity, and that is speaking to people, telling them about the, the charity, what it does, uh, what difference it makes to our lives. 
and I shall never stop uh, um, playing my trumpet on behalf of a charity.